Hello, everybody. Hello. So good to be with you. Um, I was telling um, the folks I got to do lunch with that I had never um, heard of this disorder or met anyone with it until about six weeks ago, or six or eight weeks ago for a time. And, um, uh, and then we had a friend um, uh, refer me when we were uh, looking for someone to do this presentation. And so that was, uh, I just loved the timing of that because before that I wouldn't have even known it, you know, I still know a lot about what this is about, but I sure wouldn't know anything. Um, so there's a couple of things that um, I'll start with just to give us, um, because that word mindfulness is thrown around um, a lot lately, and there's a little bit of trendiness to it and a lot of misconceptions about it and all of that. And so what I want to um, just start with, I don't have a huge slideshow. There's several things that I want to do with you, but, um, but I have a few things that mainly keep me on track. Um, but one thing is that it's helpful to know what we mean by mindfulness. So mindfulness is a capacity that we all have. Some people are sort of uh, coming into the world a bit more mindful than others. And then our early childhood experiences um, shape our degree of mindfulness. There's measures now of, of, of mindfulness. So that it is a capacity we can develop. And the first uh, sort of clinical to mainstream definition came from the MBSR world, the mindfulness-based stress reduction that John Kabat-Zinn developed at Harvard, and where that definition stresses present moment non-judgmental awareness, awareness of what's going on in this system, of body, heart, and mind, and awareness of what's going on around. Um, and that's, that's a good start. There's also another aspect in which um, mindfulness uh, is, is about being able to sort of guard, um, um, to guard uh, our thinking, not in, the case, and not in the sense that we try to control our thinking, but that we're aware of what thoughts we pay a lot of attention to. In this world, there is the um, understanding growing that our our narrative thinking is um, a sensory process, right? just like our hearing. So one of the major um, thoughts about mindfulness is people think immediately that they're supposed to be doing something to clear their mind of thinking. And that's not going to happen, um, not quite in the way that, that we colloquially think of it. Um, just like we're never going to clear our mind of hearing or smelling or this, that, or the other. And, but what we are doing when we undertake mindfulness is to, uh, to gain some muscle in choosing where we place our attention. And so, for instance, many of us have no trouble with, uh, mindfulness has aspects of concentration, which is sort of the collection of our attention when, uh, when it gets scattered, and aspects of, then, of um, awareness of them sort of pointing the power of that concentration um, in helpful ways. The, um, when we um, are in the midst of a bunch of change, um, <coughs> difficulty, <coughs> stress of any sort, there is that tendency for things to get scattered. And generally what happens is that whatever captures our attention is whatever is sort of the most um, whatever sort of hooks the brain the easiest, right? So that's why we have no trouble concentrating on a movie. Actually, if it's a movie that really sort of grabs us, we're actually not concentrating. Our attention is just being hijacked. And most of us spend our life with our attention being hijacked by one thing or another. So this is why in my work where I'm working with people with um, addictions and mental illnesses of all kinds, we're looking at sort of reclaiming free will by reclaiming the ability to choose where we place our attention. Um, when people, so there's the quality of mindfulness of being able to pay attention to what's going on, to choose, okay, is that, is that thought useful to me right now? And here's why that's important, is that just because, now I, in this space especially, I would not dare to say too much about brains or brain research, because I would assume <laughs> over my head. Uh, 
However, one of the things that we do know is that these grants we have are in many ways um, a bit, I don't know, outdated is quite the word, but you know, we have these grants that are, have a negativity bias, and it's nothing about our character. It is, um, it is all about risk reduction. Right? We, are dis we are not descended from the people that were really chill because they didn't survive. <laughs> we descended <laughs> from the sapiens who looked for the tires behind the trees that were, you know, that were on the lookout. And um, the, I came in at the uh, tail end of, um, between getting pictures made and arriving and all of that, the discussion of, of uh, inhibition and stimulation and all of that. And it, it, it made me uh, think of this a bit. But there is this tendency, this bias toward, uh, it's, it, this bias toward the negative, toward the sense of danger, is, has been adaptive for us, but like anything else, it's adaptive until it's not anymore, until it becomes part of the problem. And so this capacity to recognize a frightened or negative thought and go, do I, you know, is that useful information? And if not, can I just let that, can I just let that go? Now, of course, that's a, that's a big, that's an intellectual exercise, right? And with mindfulness, what we are doing is training our perception, which is different from our intellect. And just to give a very simple example of what I mean by that, is that intellectually, we all know that the only constant in life is change. Intellectually, we know that. We know relationships change, you get happy or unhappy, or come together, or fall apart. We know jobs change, we know all kinds of things change. We know that intellectually. The degree to which our perception is out of line with reality, we can see when things change and we feel betrayed. <laughs> like that shouldn't have happened to me. Right. Now, now to feel sad or disappointment or to, to feel lost or concern, it it's not that um, that is absolutely um, there's nothing. I guess what I want to say is there's nothing pathological about that. But that's part of the experience of change and loss is having the mixed feelings that go with that. Um, however, it's that extra layer of that shouldn't have happened to me uh, of self blame. Did I cause this in some way? Did I? And of course, it's helpful to take inventory sometimes and look at are there things I can be doing differently. Um, but as everyone in this room can attest to, there's just so much over which we do not have control, and it's not helpful as things change to um, to stay stuck in thoughts about how this isn't fair and what or what did I do? Blaming self or blaming others. Right? Um, so this, that brings up kind of the third aspect of mindfulness, and there's, and there's others, but the third aspect of mindfulness is, <clears throat> is this capacity that, that the heart slash mind develops to bear in mind what's important to you and what your intentions are and what you value no matter the circumstance. And so, for instance, we have these brains that get very hooked in, um, um, escalated when we feel a sense of threat. Now, for most of us in our everyday lives, most of our sense of threat actually comes from social threats, um, as evidenced by spending a few minutes on Facebook. <laughs> we have the same degree of, of fight, flight, freeze, or appease uh, there as if our very lives were in danger. Um, and so, and so, to be able to be aware of, I see a look on somebody's face and my body reacts in a certain way. To be able to have enough uh, clarity and mindfulness in our perception to, to not jump to conclusions about what that look on their face means, or that the fact that I'm feeling something in my body means I have to do something about this, it just buys us you know, a half a second. To go, maybe I maybe I want to see what give myself a minute to see what's going on, or maybe I want to just be aware. Maybe somebody really is being unkind or being difficult in some way, and my body is reacting in a certain way. Both of which I am powerless over over what they do and over the fact that my body has this primitive response. 
but developing the capacity for mindfulness allows us to then choose to choose how we respond to both situations. How do I care for myself in those brief moments or big moments? Um, and how do I stay true to my intentions to be, whatever my intentions are toward other people? How do I stay true to my intention to be to God, kind, to be respectful, to be, even though I'm working with this very old system that really would like to <laughs> get back in some way. Now, um, I, this slide I left in, even though uh, this is actually, this slide is actually part of a presentation I often do for professionals in, in my field, but because there's so many helpers in the room, um, and family members, or people with um, SD who are helpers, and teachers, and caregivers in other ways, um, this, uh, this idea of contemplative practice, one of the things that I want you to know about mindfulness is that mindfulness meditation uh, is not the only way we develop mindfulness. I will tell you, it expedites the process to an astonishing degree. But, but there are many, many things that we do to develop mindfulness. Things like prayer, things like other types of meditation, things like journaling, things like therapy, things like everything that we do that helps us raise our yoga, everything we do that helps us raise awareness of what's going on with this system and what's going on in our relationship to the world can raises our level of mindfulness. Um, and so it's really helpful um, when we are working with um, big shocks and traumas or the sort of uh, there's a Dr. Mark Epstein has this recent book called The Trauma of Everyday Life um, that, that is helpful and so when we are wanting to sort of work with life in a more uh, mindful more aware way um, this has to do with a shift away from giving ourselves the message or giving anybody we're trying to help the message that getting over things is our goal in fact, somebody at lunch, where are my lunch buddies? Somebody at lunch was just saying, this is not something where there's a cure. Right? So there's going to be no getting over this. There's going to be, how do I change my relationship to this um, so that I can um, live with it creatively, interact creatively, so that when I'm doing research on this, I can see <coughs> possibilities or see patterns I wasn't able to see before because I'm not stuck in the old patterns of thinking. Um, so it is not about getting over. That's not how we're going to relieve any suffering that we have going on. Um, we're also not trying to make ourselves that to believe that suffering is not suffering through what is sometimes called spiritual bypass. Um, you know, that there was a, a meme that I saw recently that said, God will never give you anything, that someone won't say something trite and insensitive about <laughs> Um, and so, um, you know, of course, we don't know what to say to people, so we end up with something probably more sensitive. Um, but that has to do with our own discomfort with when there's difficulty, and, and there's a tendency to want to sort of patch that up and use sort of the language of lessons. That's another thing that's sort of a thing in recent years is, you know, well, it's all, you know, it's all a lesson. Well, it's like, yeah, if we choose to, if we choose to redeem it in that way, everything can be a lesson. Right? Do I believe this is whatever my difficulty that does dish out to me as a lesson? Maybe, maybe if that's helpful for you, but if that's not helpful for you, you don't have to let anybody help you with that. So, but what is helpful is to, is allowing um, this ability to clarify attention to improve our connections with ourselves, right? And so um, where I work, we often speak about authentic self. Um, and, in, and this will be sort of the one segue I make into sort of a religious realm. Authentic self, what I'm talking about is referred to beautifully and poetically in many different traditions. It's referred to as your Buddha nature, or it's referred to as Christ in you, your hope of glory. Right? That aspect of us that is most connected to whatever is most real. Um, and 
when we are trapped in a world of fear and planning and <laughs> uh, and hope, hope you know, and, and hope in a not helpful way. I hope things go my way so I can feel better. I hope I get what I want so I can be happy. That's not a helpful a helpful kind of hope. Um, when when those things are sort of seen through, we have an easier time getting connected. So. Um, so I'm going to share a little bit about what we even mean by how it looks in times and moments. And we all have moments that we're more mindful than others. So I mean, we're sort of conditioned, and by conditioned, I'm talking about that brain conditioning I mentioned earlier, um, the tendency to cling, sort of the lingo around it. And clinging takes two forms. One is sort of the hanging on to something we like or the pushing away, spending a lot of energy denying, avoiding what we don't like. Either way, whether I am hanging on or pushing away, my hands are full and I am not open to what life is offering me right now. And, um, and it's a stressful way to live. and takes up a lot of uh, energy on the mental desktop. Heart conditioned or mind less. Uh, responses to stressful experience and it often is based on opinion of what should be and that's a flight response in my view. So if the clinging is a fight response, fighting the way life is or fighting something that we find difficult in our life, um, the kind of getting lost into what should be because really if we think about it there is no such thing as how it should be. And we make ourselves miserable creating stories about how it was supposed to be. Um, and all of us do it about something or other in our lives. And that's a form of flight. And then we really solidify our unhappiness around something by when our identity becomes enmeshed, confused with the thoughts around it. Right, so thinking is our only sense, maybe. I'm not, 100% sure that what I'm about to say is true, but I think it's true that our thinking is of the only sense that we tend to confuse our sense of self with. Um, and I've already thought of 14 ways that was wrong, what I just said. But <laughs> the, something that's helpful to think of, actually, um, there's an old uh, Dave Matthews song that <laughs> talks about six senses seem like five when seen through a sense of self. And then a little bit later in the song, it sort of reprises that theme by saying, I can see three corners from this corner. When I am so identified with my thinking, that puts me in one corner, and I think there's only three others, if I've never gotten out of that corner, to see the whole picture around me. And it is hugely helpful. Um, and I will, I will clean up the language, but I will share with you something that um, a fellow at work said at a half-day retreat that I was doing with some clients who sort of had a light bulb around this. And he said, oh, he really could see that he could let go of uh, judging himself based on the thoughts that arise. He said, yeah, I don't, um, I don't think of myself as a um, crappy person if I smell something crappy. I said, right, <coughs> right. He said, so just if I have a crappy thought or prize I, that I didn't invite, didn't ask for, I don't have to see myself as a crappy person. Right. You know. So we all have thoughts of fear that doesn't mean I'm a coward. We all have all those kinds of things. Now, in contrast, um, this mindfulness that we start out with some capacity for us, but as for it, but as we cultivate it, it grows and grows really strong. And as we develop that muscle to choose where we place our attention, what starts to happen is an ability to not just be aware of what we're dealing with, and not just accept what we're dealing with, but then to be able to take appropriate action. Now, um, there is there in in. Um, in the world of recovery, particularly family member recovery, <coughs> family members who have uh, been impacted by the illness of loved ones, they talk about the three A's. And we talk about this tendency we have to block out awareness, right, 
I don't want to know, I don't want to know, I don't want to know. All of a sudden, I become aware. Something happens where I can no longer be unaware. And then I want to jump to action without sitting for a minute with the painful new awareness to let a grief process move through. And when that process is through with us, it's not when we're through with it. When that process of acceptance, of healing of grief is through with us, the next right action pre presents itself. Um, our responses to things, in instead of being based on what should be, it's based on what is actually in harmony with reality. And so even though a reality may be difficult, it is, um, well, just in the example I gave about, you know, when we block out awareness um, and finally accept what we're dealing with, even if there's a wave of grief or, you know, sadness that comes with that, there's also the relief of letting go of that, trying to avoid it. And then we've already talked about the relief we get from seeing thoughts as sensory events that are just as impersonal as hearing. Now, we make our listening experience personal in a helpful way. By choosing things to listen to, we deliberately enhance listening experiences that we find beneficial or inspiring or joyful or fun for us. And we learn to do that with our thoughts as well. So it doesn't mean um, uh, ignoring thoughts we don't like. It means seeing them for what they are and over time developing the ability to see is this useful or not, and if it's not, to shift our attention to something that's more useful and more in line with reality. Um, let me see. Also, and then we're going to actually do a bit of an activity together. It's not only our response to a stressful situation that is um, altered and improved by developing mindfulness, but also our response to a stressed experiencer, meaning our response to ourselves, that is improved. So when conditioned, we often will go into, when we are dealing with something difficult, you know, the knee-jerk response to just hate pain, or hate, or in my case, I just sort of hate inconvenience and hassle. You know, that's what I think about as I was listening to you guys this morning, you know, I was hearing really just courageous choices that people have made and all of that. And one of the things I was thinking of is like, gosh, this is like several things in my own life where it's just like the hassle of having to stay on top of it. You know, it, it, that, you know, it's not that it's excruciating, but it's just the hassle of staying on top of it. The problem with sort of hating what's difficult or painful is that it's a very short walk from hating our situation to hating ourselves or having the situation. Um, sometimes we don't even realize we're carrying those attitudes toward ourselves. And once we say them out loud, we go, oh, that's ridiculous. But, but often when we don't look, it's there. And when we do look, it actually gives us some relief. There also can be sort of a self-isolation. Um, you know, um, whether you have this diagnosis or not, there's something in every human being that really has this belief, fear, whatever it is, that really what's going on is I'm somewhere here behind my eyes by myself. And all of you are out there, and you're having a wonderful time, and you're connected, and you're this and that, and I'm the only one that doesn't know how to do life. Right? And when we get into those spirals of feelings, the way back is to remember, oh, this is the one experience that everybody has at times. Everybody at times has that feeling that they're in it alone. And so that's what, I, you know, I love um, situations like this where people who are often the only people dealing with their particular um, difficulty or with a particular, you know, for miles around, I was hearing people talk about it at lunch, you know, just what a relief it is, even because it really cut, helps cut through that delusion of uh, being alone. And then, of course, we can get self-absorbed as well, which is, I sort of see as a food response. Um, so I, I want us to do sort of a little um, self-compassion activity. I also want to stay aware of the time. Um, and I will. Um, 
But we will do, we won't do a long, <laughs> just like we're not going to do some long meditation thing right after lunch. Um, <laughs> but I did want to give you this little intro because um, there is, you know, like I said, mindfulness is a quality. There is a type of, there, there's a sort of a, there's a giant umbrella in this world of what are called meditation practices, right? Mindfulness meditation is sort of a specific, you know, subset of those. It's not, it's not about anything other than sort of being with what's here and training ourselves to interact with it in ways that are useful. Um, it's not about beliefs or some, anything like that. Um, with, and then you know, the mindfulness is a subset of activities that has to do with deliberately developing uh, kindness and compassion and gratitude and serenity, by the way. But particularly, um, um, and so what I want to do is, uh, is um, in, invite you, and, uh, and you, eyes open or closed is totally up to you. Um, when you are practicing, when you're sort of undertaking the practice, what's helping you to do is whatever helps you stay most present and feel safe. Because right? we're trying to access that ability of the brain to sort of gear down. Um, and that was what I, that was one of the things that I wanted to say about this this uh, tendency we have to be geared up and hyper vigilant all the time just because of our sort of stone age brains. Actually, it's older than stone age, but <laughs> is we're a bit like I don't know how many people anymore ever drive a uh, manual uh, shift car, but if you've ever driven with the idle stuck on high. That is how our brains are operating a lot of the time. So that's the only brain thing we can do. But that's, we're like that a lot of the time. One of the things that regular practice of some sort, whether it's journaling, meditation, whatever it is, deliberately setting aside some amount of time, five or 10 minutes or 30 each day to let this brain gear down so that the flexibility is restored. Because we do still need our hypervigilance at times. It's not that we're trying to get rid of it, but we're trying to restore the flexibility. So that when we are safe, we can allow the system to shift into that that restful state. Remember that 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 slide that was talking about how um, how uh, in the research between the control group and people with SD and how at rest their brain wasn't resting. This is a huge help with exactly that kind of thing. That when we are at rest. The whole system can really sort of gear down and be at rest with some regular practice. So I want to, um, if you choose to keep your eyes open, um, that's great. And what you may want to do is sort of have them at a 45 degree angle, kind of pick something on the table in front of you to look at, just so that you sort of narrow down the visual input. Um, the reason for closing the eyes is not there's nothing woo-woo about it. The reason for closing the eyes is just to cut down the, because all of the sensory input stirs up extra thought, extra associations, extra business. And so while we're not trying to stop our thinking, we're also not trying to feed it right now. Um, and so allowing things to settle in and just taking a moment to, first of all, um, become aware of anything, uh, any shift in posture that may allow you to balance the body a little bit more so that none of the muscles have to overwork. So that between the floor and the chair and your own skeleton, the muscles can let go of that feeling of having to hold the world together that our muscles sort of habitually have. And taking a moment even just to be aware of the sense of support feeling the pressure of the chair underneath, feeling the ground beneath your feet. And certainly being aware of the support of having all the food and drink we need around us, of people around us that are dealing with some of the same difficulties that we're dealing with, just the um, support that's available in that way, and the support of this breath that comes and goes without us having to do anything. Just the way that it shows up for us moment after moment. Now we often work with the breath and settle in. This is part of that training. Because the breath is neutral, it doesn't hijack our attention the way 
an action movie was. So we're actually having to, uh, to do the work of bringing attention to it. And shifting into this practice of um, developing some self-kindness and self-compassion. You might want to push awareness slightly forward in the body so that as you're breathing, you're aware of the front of the body, the cheeks, the neck, the chest, just right at the surface of the skin where our current moment emotional experience plays with it. Experientially, older emotional experience tends to have a more solid feeling and may kind of bubble up, um, and that's great if it does, but right now just being aware of what things feel like, we're not worried about storytelling or labeling feelings, we're noticing their physical manifestation. So noticing places throughout this heart-centric area that feel warm and cool, constricted or relaxed and open, busy or calm. So having sort of given some attention to providing yourself an arena to work, just continuing to be aware of the breath through the heart center. And if you like, you can mentally work with these phrases or you can just listen and feel the effect of the words, see what you think. But we're going to deliberately work with what is called beginner self-compassion, by first noticing the response of the emotional center as you bring to mind some person or pet that is super, super easy for you to love. Many of us have to start there because that's where it's easiest for us to access. So when you think about people that are really easy for you to love, or pet that's really easy for you to love, <clears throat> noticing how when they are having a hard time, how easy it is for you to want them to be good for themselves. Noticing how that feels in the body. And then deliberately, as we enter into using some affirmations or phrases. Deliberately in your own mind and heart, pointing that kind of attention towards yourself, even if it feels odd. So I'll give you a couple of phrases to work with. You can choose none of them, or you may like one or two. May I learn to care about this, this experience I'm having, whatever it may be, right this moment. Maybe there's heat or fullness that might be overfull or stress of some kind or worry or boredom or, or maybe homesickness for some people. May I learn to care about this. May I meet this with gentleness and mercy. May I not abandon myself in this. May I be present, allowing confusion to settle into wisdom, allowing pain to be transformed into compassion, that I may be filled with compassion. sort of phrases that can be really helpful to sort of work with rhythmically, being aware of just how it feels to the body that you can say these things to yourself. Also, if you are adventurous, you can experiment with what it feels like to place a hand or both hands over your heart, because there's something that that does, brain chemistry wise, I'm told, that is soothing. <coughs> May I learn to care about this? So instead of criticizing myself to others about this, or responding with fear or hatred, may I learn to care about this? May I need this with gentleness and mercy? 
may not be present for this, but I may be filled with compassion. shorten it even more because it becomes something that is really usable even when you are just walking around in your life. When difficulties arise or that habitual stress response in the body arises, care, mercy, presence, compassion. So this is one of those ways that we train ourselves to be mindful of how we want to respond to others, to ourselves, in times of stress, care, mercy, presence, compassion. already seeing if you can shift awareness to sort of come back into interaction, but seeing if you can do that without leaving yourself. So seeing if you can sort of stay somewhat aware, have some, maybe for a few minutes there, your 60 to 80 percent of your attention will focus with your own experience. As you shift into more interaction with me, with each other, seeing if you can experiment with keeping maybe 30 percent of your attention to what's going on with you. We don't have to leave ourselves to connect to other people. In fact, we'll often feel more connected with others if we stay connected to ourselves. And as you feel ready, just sort of to Open your eyes if your eyes are closed, but just seeing if you can stay, keep some awareness of yourself. That in itself is a powerful training to recognize sometimes when we go into times of uh, prayer or meditation or journaling or self-reflection. But then, when, you know, to interact with others, really all we need to do is sort of open our eyes and ears, and we don't have to sort of leave the awareness of ourselves. It's more about sort of letting others share that interaction with us instead of leading ourselves to connect to them. Uh, many of us who live very stressful lives do just that. We leave ourselves all the time in that fight, flight, freeze, or peace. I'm going to say a little bit about this quality of equanimity. So in my home in circles, there are sort of four qualities of heart, and that's really a little bit of just poetry. There's four chambers in the heart, so there's this idea that there is this uh, the capacity for basic loving kindness, just that wish that ourselves and others be safe. Compassion is what we want to access and strengthen when those loving kind wishes are not met. When there's times of lack of safety, lack of happiness. Gratitude is the, the uh, quality of heart. Both gratitude and empathetic joy. <coughs> Developing the capacity to be just as happy for someone else and their good fortune as we are when anything good happens for us. That is a practice worth developing because that multiplies our opportunities for happiness by billions. Literally. And then there's this really clumsy, non-sexy word, equanimity, that is um, not just about balance. <coughs> And it's not about detachment in the, in the ways that we sometimes think of that word. It is about an unconditional willingness to be a good friend to yourself no matter what's happening. And so there's that sense of, you know, life will knock us this way and that, and we may, you know, and equanimity as we develop it, and these are kind of phrases that sometimes people use some version of that and deliberately. Um, those are really wordy versions of that, but those are just kind of examples. 
So I think of that as sort of the x-axis of equanimity, this sort of balance when wanting to be able to keep our balance when life knocks us back and forth. And then there's sort of this z-axis when we're interacting with others, particularly others that we love, and we want to be able to stay present to them without riding their roller coaster. So working with how do I stay open and connected and willing to be present to you in your difficulties without sort of taking over them and making them my difficult and, and inadvertently making it about me. Not robbing you of the dignity and the um, benefit, the gift of working through your own difficulties while I work through mine. The, um, I want to share a few uh, resources. So UCLA, um, and this list is pretty well up to date, I think. UCLA used to have a, a tab on that uh, Michael Williams Research Center website that I liked about their podcast <coughs> list. You could stream it right there. And if they had five minutes, 10 minutes, 15, 30. Like, however much time you have, you can work with that. Um, there are, Kristen Neff is a researcher. Uh, Brene Brown throws her name around a lot. So if you're a Brene Brown fan, she talks about Chris, Kristen Neff and self-compassion a lot. Um, there are Tara Brock. Does a, she she wrote a book that was really big years back called Radical Acceptance, and um, and she her what she a bazillions of talks or guided meditations for free. She puts new ones up every single week. So I mean you know she's got books to sell, but the the all of the um, stuff on the website is free, <coughs> and um, and and she's really good with that relational mindfulness. How do I take care of how do I hold both of our needs? When I'm struggling with a lot, how do I show up for you at the same time, vice versa? Um, in the, now specifically in um, uh, Christian circles, there, the mind, mindfulness shows up as centering prayer. So there's this process of using a phrase or using a word or to sort of collect the attention and then to be receptive uh, in that so that you have both the concentration aspects of gathering attention and the receptive awareness aspect. And, um, and when you look on like contemplativeoutreach.org, you see all over the city where, you know, all over the country where groups are held. And not too far from us, at St. Mary's at Swanee, um, they often have day-long retreats and, uh, you know, several-day retreats. It's, if this is something that interests you and you haven't done it regularly, these online resources are good. You also want to find places to do it with other people regularly. Um, that's really helpful. And um, I do want to leave any time for any, any uh, just in the last couple of minutes here, any questions or comments or about anything you've experienced when working with that? I can leave on. <laughs> it is hard. Yeah. That's why people don't leave all the time.